Okay, so then let's start with uh, the second lecture. Um, I actually talked with Senar just uh, before uh, this uh, lecture, and depending on how uh, quickly we can go, I might add an extra lecture on Saturday because I would like to discuss also sharing, which is uh, very interesting. So, but we you will uh, be informed about this. I guess I'll take the decision after this uh, lecture, uh, once I'll see how, how quickly we can progress, because I, I don't want to just speed up and then overwhelm you. So I want to give you the opportunity that you can actually follow uh, what I'm presenting, hopefully. And I also want you to be able to interact and ask questions. Does that sound good? Okay, thanks. <laughs> also, I will try to uh, write uh, bigger. So I will rely on the people in the back to complain otherwise if they cannot read what I write, okay? in terms of size, otherwise I cannot really uh, change my, my style of writing. I'll try my best, okay? So, um, last time uh, we looked at um, programming with message passing concurrency and we make the connection to session types that will be, uh, allow us to type uh, message passing uh, programs, right? And then we also saw that without further precautions taken, such a language is not type safe. In particular, preservation can fail because we can have several clients that interact with the same process along the same channel, right? So then we basically stopped by remarking that, whoa, we all heard of linear logic, right? And we all heard of the idea to use something as a resource, to have a precise account uh, the, and, and basically guaranteeing that whenever we deal with such a resource that we have to use it exactly once. So that's the idea of linear logic. And then one of you also said when I asked, well, what, what should be the resource in our setting? So one of your classmates said, well, the channels. And I guess many of you thought the same. All right, so that's where we were at. And then I kind of ended with the question. So we all know that linear logic is a substructural logic, which means that it rejects uh, weakening and contraction. And I asked you, do you have any ideas what that means in terms of the process graph that we get? Any ideas on that? That's the thing I'll tackle next. If no ideas, uh, that, that's not an issue. I was just wondering. All right, so let's, let's look at this then. Uh, let me write down the rules again here. So let us remind of the weakening and contraction rules, okay? Uh, so weakening, we have uh, the following rule. Okay, I have to go bigger. I already noticed. Okay, so How's the size? Okay, and people in the back? Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Okay, so that's the weakening rule. And then let me write down uh, the contraction rule. Okay, so these are the two rules that are no longer admissible in linear logic. So how, how are we going to interpret these rules in, in, a, in a process calculus? What, what do they mean, right? So first, meaning that they're not admissible means they, they, can never be, they can never be applied, basically. So we don't get those rules. So either they're admissible, which means they are uh, not explicitly present in, in the logic, 
or we could also have them explicitly present, but in any case, they're not there, either implicitly or explicitly. Okay, so what's the intuition behind those rules? So I'm going to write that down. So you can think of, of weakening as dropping a resource. And, and why is that the case? Because I'm going to use an into, uh, uh, sorry, right, I'm going to use an intuitionistic interpretation of, lo uh, of linear logic, but also I'm going to use the sequent calculus. Uh, so in the first week, Paul actually presented the linear logic using a sequent calculus uh, presentation. Okay. And in terms of once we are going to add process terms, which we haven't added yet here, so that's just the, the logic rule. But you can think of the premise as describing the continuation of the process, the next thing we do. And then you can see that the continuation no longer has the A, right? The premise does no longer have the A. So in a sense, we are dropping something, right? So that's the intuition, yeah? Uh, it's not quite because when we close it, we actually make sure that we terminate it. Okay, it's more like we were. Oh, okay, so I have to double check. Do you mean closing our offering service if we just terminate? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So if we were to terminate and having still resources lying around, so things that we are clients of, that will be exactly weakening. Because we, we don't care about cleaning up, we just drop it. Okay, that's exactly right. So then here, this thing you can intuitively think of as duplicating a resource. And again, when you look at the rule, right, so we start out with a proposition A, a resource A, and in our continuation, we actually have an extra copy of it lying around. And in particular, if we had several, several premises, then in a structural logic, we could propagate a resource to all of those premises. And that's exactly what contraction allows us to do. All right, so, now that we have some kind of grasp at what weakening and contraction are about, let's uh, make it even more intuitive by looking at the process graph. So let's look at our, I, I'm going to use again our Q that we used earlier. So <clears throat> we have here our client, which is interacting with the head of the Q, Uh, so that's, I'm going to write that again here. So that's going to do the client. So CL for client. Here we have the Q. And then uh, we had here O, P, L in it. So if we were to allow, if we were, um, if weakening were allowed, what we could do is basically, we could decide to terminate the, the client process, and then we would end up basically with the queue that has now no longer any client. So by weakening, it would be if we had weakening then something like this would be permissible. Yeah? We should be dropping the channel between client and queue instead of terminating the client, right? Because we are dropping a resource. And client is not a resource. Channel is a resource. Um, well, the client, yes, exactly. So we are... Um, 
Um, okay, I, let me see. Um, Okay, so I think, it, I see, so from the point of view, you can, uh, I haven't set that up nicely, okay? So from the point of view, there, there's going to be a client for client, so the picture I draw, drew is from that point of view. So let me make the picture such that, let me correct the picture. Uh, let me put, do this. Okay. All right, so now let's imagine we are going to terminate this process, right? Then we have here the client, and now this guy, the P, basically has now no longer a client, okay? What I, what I put on the board earlier was from the point of view of the client's client, okay? All right, so the point is, and maybe, right, so the point is that it is possible to have basically processes in the system that do not have a client. Okay, so now let's look at the picture if uh, we admit contraction. So if we admit contraction, we can have something like this. So we have our Q, this again is our client, and that's the head of the Q. If we have contraction, what we can do is we can send a reference to a channel that we keep as a resource to someone else. So we could get something like this. Okay, so, and uh, let me also write that down. So, if we don't have weakening and contraction, what does it mean? <gasps> Putting it all together. It means that every process has a client Right, and it also means that every process has a single client. What kind of data structure is that? Huh? Well, list is a special linked list is a special case of it. A tree, right? We are going to get a tree. So, so basically our, when we add, when we remove weakening and contraction and we use linear logic, our process graph will turn into a tree where we have a designated root node, which is basically our main, main, main process, right? The process that starts, that spawns all other processes. And then we get all the processes, all the children basically, okay? And that there can be like arbitrary number of children, of course. So, when we take this description of the graph, which is a tree, and I, I think it's really helpful to think in terms of the tree, then what is the parent? Well, it's our client, right, from the perspective of a process. And the child is the providing process, so the provider. So in the Q example, the Q is a child of, of our client. 
And the next one, the next element in the queue is a child of the head of the queue and so forth. Okay, so now tell me, if we have this programming model and this restriction on the runtime graph, where every provider has exactly one client, and, and, and really pay attention to my formulation, I say exactly one. I'm not saying at least one. If we were in at least one, then we are in an affine logic which means there might be one. If there is one, it's, it's only one. It's at most one, right? So we say, we know that every process, every providing process has exactly one client. So now that we know this, what about preservation? What was the problem with preservation earlier? Right. You wanted to say something also? No? Okay. <laughs> Good. Okay. So, well, we saw earlier that the problem with, in our, like, setting where we don't have any restrictions at all, the problem is that, well, processes, providing processes can have several clients. And if one client interacts with one process, it's going to advance the state of the protocol of the provider. But all the other clients still believe that the providing process is in its original state. So if they try and go ahead and communicate with that process according to the protocol and the state they believe the process to be in, they will get a runtime exception, something like message not understood. But now that we restrict that every provider has exactly one client, it's just magically, it's, it's working out, or let's say not magically, by design. If the client interacts with the process, it knows as a result that the process will step, and also the process will step. So the two expectations always match up. Okay, any questions on this? Yeah? So how does it work in like a real example where you have a server and it has many clients? Very good question. Uh, it depends on if you really want sharing, right, one server, that doesn't work. We cannot do it. And that's why I'm going to talk about manifest sharing. All right? But I want to, to uh, make clear that there are many examples we can do in a linear setting. But there are some we can't. For example, implementing dining philosophers we can do in a linear setting. Well, the nice thing is we, we prevent deadlock by construction, but there are certain scenarios we cannot accommodate. Okay, I'll get back. For those of you who are now puzzled, I'll get back to this sharing issue late, later. Today we talk about linear, linear session types. But uh, what I want you to understood to have understood up to this point is that what kind of restrictions we get in terms of the process graph using linear logic. And I also want you to kind of understand that this is the key to getting preservation, session fidelity working. Are we all on the same page with regard to this? Good, okay, there was a question. Yes, right. We can do a replication by introducing, using a basically bang of linear logic. And I'm also going to talk about this. But note, we get replication, we get a copy. We don't get the same thing. So for example, for a print server, we would, have, we would need to have several printers around, right? We can always generate a new printer, which is not what we want. So it really depends on the application scenario. But you're right, we can have replication in a linear setting with the bang modality. 
but that's not necessarily what we need in all circumstances. Okay, that was an advanced question. If that kind of just flew over your head, that's okay, we'll get to that. All right, so uh, then let me move on. So we're now all set up to talk about linear logic. We understood the benefits, also the, already the limitations. Um, and now we are going to see, we've, we've talked about the session type connectives earlier, but what we are going to do next is basically put those session types onto a logical underpinning, and that's linear logic. So what we try to do is basically to interpret the session type connectives in terms of linear connectives. And that's something that was discovered a few years ago uh, by um, Frank Fenning. He's a professor at CMU and I'm fortunate to work with him. And Louis Kerr. And um, so what, what they discovered is that there is a Curry-Howard correspondence between session-typed process calculi and intuitionist, intuitionistic linear logic. And you, you might have heard of other Curry-Howard correspondences, right? Between intuitionistic um, logic and uh, the, the lambda calculus. So this is an analogous correspondence that now relates linear logic, so intuitionistic linear logic with a session type, basically with the session type pi calculus. Yeah? Is there an equivalent to classical logic? Is there is one. I'm going to write that down. That was uh, discovered then later uh, by Phil Wadler. All right. Uh, so actually, let me erase that uh, because I want to use this main board here. Or, or maybe I just pull it up, sorry. So I guess it's still parent, um, what did I exact as a client, and then child is the provider. Okay. All right. Okay, so. So there's a Curry Howard oh, I don't need this hyphen here Curry's correspondence between intuitionistic linear logic and the session typed pi calculus. All right. So this correspondence was discovered by CARE Maybe it's Keres. Actually, I should really know how to, to pronounce Louis' last name. I'm sorry about that. Maybe it's Keres. I'm not sure about it. Uh, and Fenning. And that was in 2010, I believe. Yeah. 2010. It's a Concur paper. I can uh, provide references later if you like. And then as asked also by one of your classmates, there has been um, uh, also, uh, so basically Phil Wadler in 2012, uh, he had an ICFP paper and that uh, basically worked out the correspondence for classical linear logic. All right, so what is this correspondence about? And I know that in the first week, Paul has talked about the Curry-Howard isomorphism or correspondence already for functional programming. So, and you know that basically, uh, or, or let's work it out. 
what, what's the correspondence in the functional setting about? Do you remember? All right, so the slogan is basically propositions as types, proofs as programs, right? All right, what are, what are our propositions here in this setting? Right, exactly. So we have the following correspondence between logic and then we have here uh, programming. Okay, so here we have linear propositions And over here we have session types. Okay, so then we have proofs over here, right? <clears throat> and over here we have programs. And then we have over here, cut reduction. And that manifests as basically message exchange in programming. So that manifests as communication. All right, so we are going basically to look into this now as a next step. We are trying to we rediscover basically the session type connectives from uh, basically pulling them out from linear logic. So we are, what we are going to do is we revisit the linear logic connectives for the intuitionistic, for an intuitionistic formalization and then try to see, basically rediscover what uh, Fenning and Kairis did try to understand how can we interpret them in terms of session types and what kind of operational interpretation can we give those connectives. And uh, then uh, we'll look at later on, we'll, we'll start programming in that setting using the concurrent language C0. And I will briefly touch on this, so we will we'll look at the dynamics a little bit. I'm not going to go into cut reduction really. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with it, will understand it, otherwise uh, we'll leave it at that. Okay, that, there was a question. Is it the proof corresponding processes? Yes, yeah, right, process, process terms, correct, yeah. Good. Uh, so, so now let's uh, look into the linear connectives and try to basically interpret them in terms of session types. Um, I guess now I will, I'm going to use this board and uh, I should pull that up. Uh, all right, that it wasn't. All right, maybe that helped. Good. And first of all, let's revisit the linear connective. Let's do that over there so we can have it as a reference. So I'm going to use, so different to Paul, he used tau, I'm going to use ABC to send for uh, linear propositions and also then session types. Okay, tell me what, are, what connectives do you remember from linear logic? Any suggestions? Lollipop. Lollipop, yeah, well that's a, I understand that, that's also the first one I, I really found interesting <laughs> because uh, only by virtue how it's written, right? Okay, so that's going to be uh, what is also referred to as multipl multiplicative uh, implication, right? I'm going to abbreviate that. 
All right. So what's the dual to that? Do you remember? What was that? Yes, so tensor. That's the multiplicative conjunction. All right, then what else did we have? Yeah, we have with. Okay, that's additive conjunction. All right, and then the dual of it, plus. which is going to be the additive disjunction. All right, and I guess the, someone earlier mentioned replication, so which connective would that be? The bang, right, of course. So that's referred to as of course, or also as basically a persistent, persistent truth. Okay, so just as a side note, you might wonder why certain connectives are called multiplicative and the others additives. It has to do with the fact how they are defined. When it's multiplicative, we basically have to split the resources. When it's additive, they are propagated to all premises because that's okay, even in a linear setting, because we are forced to make a choice. We cannot use both. So that's uh, for, for the terminology. I find it always helpful to understand terminology because often there are some Sometimes the terminology is badly chosen, so it doesn't help you, but sometimes they're really chosen to convey some information. And I think here that's, that's the case. All right, so as you can see already, uh, we don't have par because we are in the intuitionistic setting. Uh, also, um, I'm not go we are not going to have units for, um, with and plus, because what would that mean? It means that there, there's no choice, there are no labels, which means that there's no computational content. We are not communicating anything. So in a computational setting, the units for um, with and plus are, are not interesting. So that's why we're dropping it. Um, so we require So the requirement is that um, with and plus have to have at least one label. All right. So before going into uh, oh, all right, I can't move that. Well, all right. Before going into the individual connectives, let's try and understand the typing judgment that we are going to use. Yeah? By unit, did you mean like a neutral value? Yes, okay. right, exactly. So all the, it's like, uh, you know, in mathematics, like high school mathematics, you have plus, yeah. which is the unit of sum and negation, right? So, so in linear logic, we have those neutral elements, the unit, unit connectives, okay. All right, so 
what we are, so let me write it down here. I think uh, that, no, no, actually I don't want to do that because I want to have some, so I'm going to raise over here. So I'll try to basically maintain on the left, uh, left and right, the, the outer boards, basically stuff that you, that we keep as a reference. Uh, okay. All right, so the typing judgment that we are going to use will be of the following form. So we have basically given some resources I'll, I'll write it down and then I'll explain. And then I use here. Exactly. All right. So that's our typing judgment to, to type process terms. So how are we going to read this? We say, well, we have a process term P. You can think of it as a, the, a process program. And this process offers a session A along channel X and in order to do this it is a client of the following other processes. Processes that offer along channels X1 to Xn that offer sessions of type A1 to An. Okay, so let's write that down because I think it's helpful so that you have a reference, right? So process P offers a session of type A along channel X using sessions <coughs> of types A1, I forgot the one here, through AN that are offered along channels X1 to Xn. All right, that's how we read that judgment. So let's connect that back to our process graph, right? So in terms of the, the trees we get, it's, it looks like follows. This is going to be our offering process, P, okay, uh, where P is of type A. And then it has the following children, children, All right, so note that the process typing judgment is always expressed from the point of view of a provider. And to the left, so that's what we have on, on the right to the turnstile. And there's only one thing because we use an intuitionistic formulation. And to the left, we have everything that we are using, everything that we are a client of, and these are the children in the tree. Okay, I'm just, I'm just trying to connect back to uh, what we've worked out so far. I, I'll try to provide you a multidimensional view on, on, on the material. Yes, correct, exactly, yeah. 
that's that's uh, a, a tree can have a parent can have multiple children, but a child has only one parent in a tree. <laughs> All right. So now that we worked out, so my my goal was to make you understand the typing judgment. Because I, uh, sometimes people brush over it and then uh, one tries to understand it while trying to understand the connectives. But now we understand the judgment and now we can understand the connectives. So, now I ask you, these are the connective of linear logic. And in the curry Howard connect, uh, correspondence, what we are trying now is basically to see how they match to the session type constructs we saw earlier. So um, I could write it on the board, but let's not spend time on this, but let, let me remind you verbally. So when we looked at session types, we said, well, we need the ability to make a choice, right? Either the, the provider can make a choice or the client can make a choice. And we also need the ability to send and receive um, values or channels. All right, so that's what we need. And if we are doing what uh, Fenning and Kairos did, we are trying now to see basically which one of the connectives, looking at the rules of the connectives, um, matches the, uh, that semantics. So do you have a favorite one? I have a favorite one to start because there seems to be an obvious connection. Uh, do you have an idea? Of course, I don't want to do that right away. <laughs> then we'll step light years ahead. So <laughs> But I mean, just I mean, there's actually there are two connectives on the board. Exactly, because uh, that's basically what we had already, right? Even the symbol is the same thing, right? So that's that's a good choice. So let's let's go with that. All right. So, but uh, we will get to, of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> But then we'll, we'll kind of step up a level, so we have to go step by step. All right, so let us remind us of, the, of, um, of this connective, the additive um, conjunction. Uh, let's write down the right rule first. So I'm going to um, write down the logic, the, the logical, the linear logic rule first. So, oh, right, right, right. So I have to say that. Uh, I also, for convenience, and that's actually not convenient for me right now, but all right, I manage. So we like to uh, basically abbreviate that by, by delta, okay? So that's our linear context. Okay, so let us remind uh, of the rule, and I have to glance here how much space I'm going to need because we are going to add process term then later on to this rule. I guess that should be about the space I need. Um, so, and then we have here A with B. Okay, so that's what we get from linear logic. So that's going to be <clears throat> the right rule. And then what do we get above? I'm, I'm going to write it down. Not all of you might remember, but once you see it, you'll, you'll remember. Okay, so we basically get here that given delta, we can, okay, let me see the space I need about this. Okay, we can prove an A. And then we get a second premise. Uh, I have to add a little bit more space. Let me add this. So, and then here, given a delta, right, I can prove a B. 
That's the right rule. So now what we are going to do is we are going to fill in process terms. I'll try to use blue, and if that's not visible, let me know in, in the back. Um, so this is just what we get from linear logic, right? That's the rule. And you can see the additive nature because we don't have to split the resources, which forces us to make a choice, right? So as a provider, we must be pre prepared to both offer a session of type A or type B, depending on what the client chooses. So now we are going to add in the process terms, basically, which I'm going to do in blue. So well, what, what will we need, right? I mean, over there we have channels. We don't have any channels here. So we need a way to kind of name the resources that we're dealing with. So let's, go, let's do that, right? Let's add channels. So here, I'm going to add the channel. And here, and here. Okay. Um, any suggestions for the process term here? We're basically trying to um, make a choice, or not a make a choice, that's not, not the right word here. But depending on what kind of choice the client makes, we have to either do this or that. Do you know, do you, does that sound like familiar from programming? Is there any construct we could use? Switch. Switch, kind of, yeah. So I'll use case. So we do, we case analyze. We say, okay, depending on what, what X is, we either do P1 or P2. Okay, so now it's simple. What, what, what are the process terms for the premises? What should I fill in here? P1, right? Uh, it could also be P, P2, but it's, we read from left to right. So. Okay, and then we have P2 over here. Okay, and now we have our process typing rule for the right rule of an external choice. Motivated by linear logic. So if we erase the blue parts, we get linear logic. With the blue parts, we have linear session types. Okay, so now let's look at the left rule. Because it's additive and the client has to make a choice, right? How many left rules are we going to get? We get two left rules, right? Because the, the client makes a choice. All right, so let's write that down. Again, I'll, I'll glance here so that I make sure to have enough space. Um, so given delta, and then we also have a resource that offers A with B. And then we have in here the process term. Uh, maybe not enough space. And we just prove a C. And then here we actually have an A. And we can prove the C. All right. So again, we're going to add um, channels. So. We are now a client, right, 
of a process that provides an external choice. So we, we offer along some channel C. And we are actually, we're the client of that process that offers along X. All right, so what, what is going to go in here? So we have to indicate to the process our choice. And right now we have two possibilities. So any ideas for a construct for, from programming or even the, lam, uh, the, 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 I guess, lambda calculus with pairs and sums you heard about earlier in the first week? What was it, left I heard? Yeah. Right, exactly. So what I'm going to use is actually in left. So we say, okay, in left, and then we continue with Q. That's our continuation. So that's the current process here, and we indicate the choice we make. Once we have communica communicated that choice, uh, how, what's our continuation type? It's Q, right? We, uh, sorry, we, we execute Q, and now we actually have X, we now have an A, right? Okay, so let's write down the other left rule, which uh, is going to be straightforward. I'm just going to write it down. Uh, oh. Okay, I have to be the blues are very, very difficult to open always. All right, here we go. Okay, so here we have an X of type A with B. And then, of course, now we communicate that we do in right, and we continue as a Q. And we offer along Z a type capital C. Okay, and then we get here, basically, the only difference is that we get a B. And then we continue also as our Q. And then here also we, whatever we offer is untouched by this communication with the provider. Okay. So now we've already done one connective. So, Let's do then the next one. Which one are we going to do? I, I think it's kind of, we already did one, so how about the dual, right? So let's do additive disjunction. So this one, oh, maybe I should write this down. So here we did external choice. Uh, I want to write it somehow. Okay, so I write it here. Choice, okay. And for programming purposes, we are going to expand this or generalize it to any choice. Because why should we only always be able to choose, on, uh, to, to choose among uh, between two things, right? So this naturally generalizes to um, arbitrary number of labels. Then we basically get instead here in the in the right rule, instead of two premises, we get n premises and n left rules. Okay, so let's do now the additive disjunc disjunction, which is the dual, so it's internal choice, which means it gives the provider the choice. 
what does that mean already when we look at the right rules? Now that the provider can choose, how many right rules do we get? Two, right? Uh, in the binary case. Okay, so let's write that down again. So, so given a delta, and then I have some process term here, I now offer an A with B And in order to do that, it's sufficient that given a delta, I can basically prove an A. Right? So that's the, the plus right rule one. So let me write down the, the other one right away, which is going to be this. So I offer an A with B. And then here it's sufficient that we offer B. Okay. By the way, how's the, the font size in the back? Good. All right. Wonderful. So let's add the, the process terms again. I'll put that. Um, so again, I'm going to use, as I did over here for the offering channel, I'm going to use X. So we fill in the channels here. And then basically any suggestions in terms of what construct to use for the process term. Uh, you'll notice already that the two connectives are duals of each other, right? So how about just using the matching, the corresponding term? So that means here we're going to communicate our, uh, along our offering channel X. We are going to say, hey, we, we do an in left. In left. And then we continue with Q, right? And then analogously here, we are going to say we do an in right. And then we continue with Q, which means now that up here, we do the Q. And up here, we do the Q. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Oh, God. Thank you. I did it right over here. <laughs> okay. All right, so here we go. And now we have analogously only one left rule. Right? Because the, the client has to be prepared to deal with either of the choices that the provider makes. Uh, so again, here we have now as a client, we are, um, where did I put this? The blue. I'll write it down right, right away. Um, So here I have an x, I offer a plus, plus b, and then of course we can use, uh, reuse the, um, well, the, the, the same, uh, basically the idea, so use the case. We do a case x um, off. And then we either do P1 or P2. And we offer along our channel C, A, C. And 
And then here in the premise, we now have um, two premises, one time where x is of type A, <clears throat> uh, in which case we execute P1. And we still offer a C. And then we have another premise where this time the X is of type B. And we execute P2, but we still offer a C. All right. And now we have the left rule. OK, so there's one thing I already want you to notice now that we've written down basically two connectives. And th there's an important uh, working kind of uh, to observe. So what you can see is that when we look at the right rule, that as a result of stepping, in the protocol, the type of the offering process changes. That's the case for right rules, right? We, here we can see that we start out with offering an A with B, and in the continuation, we now offer a B. For left rules, that's not the case. So left rules, they communicate not along their offering channel, but they communicate along a channel of a client. So that means what when they step, the offering channel remains the same, the type of the offering channel remains the same, but the type of the client will change as a result of the interaction. Yeah, I just want, I want you to observe this. So that also tells you something else. So um, in a session type, linear session type setting, Processes are connected with channels, but channels are bidirectional, meaning that either the client can send us something and the provider receives, or the other way around. And as a process, we can choose whether we are talking at one point along our offering uh, channel, or we basically turn our back to our offering channel and to our client and whether we talk to one of the processes that we are a client of. And that, that will become important later on when we talk about progress. I just want you to basically understand this. OK, let me take a sip of water and you have some time to digest. We can, but I'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> That's also one of the benefits of linearity. So there's, there are good reasons why we use linear, linearity. OK, so now let's uh, continue <clears throat> in this exploration of basically rediscovering the Curry-Howard isomorphism right, for ourselves. Um, and you see, actually, now it seems so, so simple, right? But because we already know all those things. Uh, so now it seems almost obvious, but that's usually the case for good ideas, right? Once you have the right uh, insight, you think, why didn't I think of that earlier? It's so obvious. So that's usually an indication that you're on the right track. Good. OK, so now let's move on and uh, talk about the remaining connectives, except for bang, you still have to wait a little bit. Where? <laughs> All right, so I think I have here another board. Right, I do, OK. So let's start. I, I'm now choosing which one to go first, because I think it's easier to explain, and then the other follows. So um, 
Okay, I'll, I'll start. So I want to go with Lolly because we all said like Lolly is fun, right? Lollipop. So let's go with Lolly. Uh, so let's write the um, connective down first. The linear, uh, basically the linear rule. So given a delta, oops, no, no. I need more space. <laughs> Uh, okay, given a delta, then there's going to be a process term here. Oh, maybe I'll give myself a little bit more space. I can prove an A lolly B. Provided that given a delta and now an A I can prove a B okay so that's the lolly right rule I have my blue pen we're going to fill in the process terms. First step, easy thing, we add channels everywhere, right? So we offer a long x. I mean, it doesn't have to be x, but I'm trying to, to set up a convention so that it's easier for us to, to think about the rules, okay? Usually I, I use the x for the right rule. Okay, and now well, we have an A over here, there, right? It has to be offered along a different channel. So let's say that it's going to be offered along a Y. Okay, so let's think about this. What, that, what does that mean? So we started out offering an A lolly B. And then once we do this communication, whatever that's going to be, we now offer a B and all of a sudden got an A, right? The A showed up, right? Okay, so what does that mean? We got that, right? How can we get something? How can we get a value in a session type? What? I heard it. Right, we received something. Okay, so that's channel input, right? We receive a channel. So let's write that down. So the syntax I'm going to use is say, okay, receive, and we receive that along x, right? And then we continue as a p. Okay, so we receive something that now means when we, in our continuation, what, what are we executing? After we have received the channel, we just continue executing the P, right? Okay. So, that's channel input. Uh, all right, I should have written here, I said external choice. So, over here, and maybe I can, oh, all right, I can read it. So that's going to be internal choice. Oh. You make me work. <laughs> Doing some gymnastics in addition to everything else. Okay, so that's channel input. I just write, no, maybe I should say channel also. All right, so let's look at the left rule. Okay, so, and now notice that's a multiplicative connective, right? So what does it mean in terms of the deltas? We split them. Okay, so that means already that here we have a delta and a delta prime, 
And then we are the client of something that offers an A lolly B. Then we have here a process term. And now we offer along some channel a C. Well, actually, I'm not yet there at channels. I'm still in logic, so I shouldn't have said that. OK, so here we have the left rule. So now we have two premises, right, because it's multiplicative. So we have given a delta, we can prove an A. And given a delta prime and a B, Um, we can prove a C. All right, so let's add the channels. So I used earlier the the C to denote the offering channel uh, of a left rule. And then I use the X here. That's the offer we get. And now basically just imagine, right? So the right rule is going to receive something. What does it mean for the left rule? So the right and the left rules always match up, right? So one is the provider, the other is the client. So if the provider wants an input, what does the, the client have to do? It has to send something, right? So it's going to send a long X uh, something which I'm going to I have to move this over a little bit. I need more space here. Okay, so I'm going to elide this for now. And it's going to continue as a Q prime. Uh, so let's figure exactly what it is going to send. But obviously it has to send something that is of type A. Right? Because that's what uh, the provider expects. And also, we know that after the exchange, the provider will be of type B. All right. So, looking at the linear rule, it basically seems to indicate that, well, we are going to continue as B, but also there is going to be something kind of created which is of type A. So what that essentially means is we are going to spawn a new process along a new channel Y. And that's exactly what we get up here. So we spawn a new process that offers a session of type A. And that guy we are going to send to the provider. Uh, notice that I've already said that we are going to spawn a process and we'll get later to that specific rule. Um, and once we talk about that rule, we can also uh, discover together a variant of that uh, rule, which allows us to send a channel that we already have in our context. But we'll get to that. OK, so now that we have channel input, what, what are we missing? What's well, kind of the dual to that? Output, right? OK, and uh, what connective will that be? Tensor, right, exactly. So 
Let's write that down. And since that's kind of easy, I'm just going to write it down so that we're not losing too much time on this. So, but uh, notice again that they're kind of dual to each other, which will become clear. So let me write down first uh, the right rule. So the right rule is now going to be the one that is going to send, and sp so send a, and spawn a new process. Here we have two premises analogously to the left rule, uh, where we have the Q Y A, and then another premise where we have the delta prime, and we continue. Oops, I forgot that here. I just squeeze it in if you allow me to do that. So that's going to be the Q prime. And that's going to be the B. So that's going to be tensor right. And then uh, let's do the left rule. So we are the client of a process that offers an A tensor B. So that means now, because tensor is an output, it means that we are going to receive a channel along X. And then we continue as P. And we are just basically offering a C of type C. And then as a result of that exchange, now X will be of type B. But we also got on Y an A. And now we continue as P, and we still offer a C. Okay, and that's the tensor left rule. Right, so what I'd like to, if you give me two more minutes, I'd like to add another connective, which is actually, um, going to be a unit. So in linear logic, we have one which is the unit of the multiplicative conjunction. And that's what we are going to use to terminate a session. Remember that in the session types, we also had to, um, we needed the possibility to terminate a session. And the reason when you look at all uh, the um, basically why this choice makes sense. It's because that unit doesn't have any antecedents. So let me just write that down here. So let's look at the connective. Uh, I'll, I'm going to put it over there. I should fit it here. Okay, so the right, re right rule for uh, the for one is not having any resources, we can offer something of type one. That's the one right rule. It doesn't have uh, any premises. And now if we annotate this with process terms, 
we basically offer this along channel X, and what we do is we, we simply close X. And then let's look at the left rule. So in the left rule, we do have some context, and in this context, we have one resource that offers a one. And then, given this, we are going to offer some C. And basically then in our continuation, we don't have that anymore. And we still continue to offer a C. So adding the process terms here, we get the channel, we offer that along C. And the one is offered along the channel X. And what we are going to do is basically we wait for X to terminate. And once X has terminated, we continue as a P, which means up here in the continuation, we execute P. And that's going to be the one left. What I'm missing over here is that the one And so, with this rule, I would like you to note something important, which goes back to the, uh, to the rules of weakening, right? So here, we are actually required that, sorry, here, in the right rule, we are required that we can only terminate ourselves if there are no resources anymore in our context. And that makes sure that we don't have basically trees floating around without the root, without the carrot. Okay, so time, time tells me that I have to close for today, uh, which means we are going to finish up uh, the correspondence next time, um, which means I'm definitely going to talk on Saturday also, if that's okay with you, because otherwise we cannot get into sharing, and we cannot talk about BAM. <laughs> so, all right, so then I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll be uh, in the morning, and I think uh, uh, we'll have a session Saturday, basically I'll be the last one, right, on Saturday. Yeah, you will fall, we'll see. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay, so see you tomorrow.